Hey, good morning everybody. Matt Zerby here from Wasco Nursery. Coming to you on uh, Saturday of Mother's Day weekend. Uh, we are really uh, happy that the sun is shining. We had a little bit of the dreaded uh, F word yesterday. Yeah, that's frost. Uh, we had some frost last night. Um, probably get a handful of phone calls about that. Hopefully everybody brought their tropical plants or annuals or vegetables or anything that they may have had outside already. Hopefully they brought those inside from, for the night. Um, if you have some plant material that suffers a little bit of minor frost damage, uh, you know, perennials, shrubs, all of that kind of stuff are going to be perfectly fine. Even if you have a couple of leaves here and there with some minor frost damage, um, they'll be perfectly fine. If you've got some uh, plants that have a little more frost damage, a little bit of uh, Jack's Classic fertilizer will be helpful. That's a water-soluble high nitrogen fertilizer. That'll help the plant push out some nice fresh foliage. Um, there's a little scooper in the bucket. It's one scoop per gallon of water. You could do that about once a week or so for the next couple of weeks if, you're, if you do have some plants that suffer some minor or major uh, frost damage. Um, annuals or vegetables that got frosted last night probably will not come back. Um, they usually, uh, usually will suffer uh, just complete uh, death from, uh, you know, from frost and things like that. So, uh, but perennials and stuff, are all going to be great. We're going to talk about a handful of, uh, of plants today. Um, today I didn't really have an actual uh, topic per se. It's Mother's Day weekend. Um, we are super busy around here, which is, which is great. Um, we have a ton of beautiful plant material, and so uh, I just decided I'd walk around and grab uh, eight or ten of my favorite plants uh, and just introduce them to you, uh, tell you about the care and culture, where to best grow them, that type of thing. Um, and then introduce a few of the topics for the next couple of weeks. Um, some things that you can kind of put on your radar. Uh, we're going to have a uh, talk about roses. Um, roses used to be super popular in the you know, 50s through the 80s. Uh, roses were exceptionally popular uh, kind of all across the country, but you know, definitely here in the upper Midwest. Uh, and then roses have kind of fallen out of favor because there's, uh, there's some rose diseases. They require a little bit more care. People weren't really into that. But over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been some major improvements in rose breeding, uh, disease resistancy, flower, hardiness, all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about some of our favorites, how to grow them, how to care for them. So that'll be coming up. Um, we're going to have a talk about hydrangeas. Um, hydrangeas are one of those things that baffle a lot of, uh, a lot of gardeners in the area how to care for them, when to trim them, how to trim them, what variety is best for uh, which situation. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. So those are a couple of, uh, couple of upcoming ones. And then we'll also have a talk about um, uh, conifers. So conifers are cone-bearing plants, uh, like pines and spruce and things like that. Uh, we're gonna have a talk about them, um, more specifically some of the more rare and unique varieties. Um, which include a lot of uh, dwarf and uh, strange uh, plants. So those will be kind of fun too. So um, yeah, so let's get started with, uh, with today. Um, this, is, uh, this is a dianthus right here. Uh, this is part of uh, Proven Winners uh, Perennial Collection. Um, it's part of a series called Paint the Town. So there's a few different Paint the Town uh, dianthus. There's a Paint the Town fuchsia and magenta and different things like that. But um, one of the things that I love about uh, Dianthus is the, uh, the kind of powdery blue foliage, which may be hard to see in the video here, but the foliage has a nice powdery blue color. Um, it's also a little stronger clumping plant than some of the other Dianthus. Sometimes some Dianthus sort of look like a cat sat in the middle of it. This one really fills out nicely, holds up great, but you can also see its exceptional flower power. Um, these are all buds that have yet to open Obviously, some of these other flowers have already opened, so you know you've got this nice, bright, purpley pink flower. It actually has a little bit of fragrance to it, um, but it's going to bloom for a solid six weeks, if not more. This is a wonderful border plant. It likes full sun. This would do great along the front edge of a bed. It would do great in the foreground if you've got taller shrubs or perennials behind it. Um, it's great in mass. It's also great even in small containers. You know, this is a, it's just a, a nice little, uh, nice little heavy flowering variety. So that's Paint the Town, if you, uh, I think this one's, yeah, Paint the Town Magenta, um, but really a great uh, little perennial plant there.
This is a, a geum right here. So geum is probably a little lesser known uh, group of plants. We actually have a native geum uh, that, uh, here in Illinois that we call prairie smoke. Um, this is not the native geum, but it is equally as hardy and has very similar uh, flower buds, but the flower itself is much different. Um, this has these nice peachy pink uh, flowers. They're a little bit bigger than a quarter. It is a very heavy flowering variety. The foliage is very nice on it. One of the things that I like about geum is that geum uh, is resistant to rabbit damage and deer damage. Uh, it does not seem that the rabbits or uh, deer bother geum for, uh, for whatever reason. Um, so you end up with this nice mound of green foliage, all of these flower stems that stick up. This is another plant with a long bloom time. So you can see we've got some nice open flowers currently. But then behind that, when these are done, you've got all of these other buds coming along. So it just kind of continually blooms. It's a spring bloomer. So we're talking uh, end of April or early May, and then it's gonna go throughout May well into June typically. Um, so really nice plant, easy to grow, full sun, um, not uh, particularly water hungry or anything. So just a nice, uh, easy to grow plant. Also fairly tolerant of heavy clay soils, which is kind of nice because not all perennials love, uh, love that. If you've got a little bit of shade in your yard, uh, you may already be familiar with a stilby. Um, one of the things that is tough about a stilby is that they, are, uh, they hate to dry out. They are not drought tolerant plants. Um, and so if you put, a, put some of the uh, a stilby in your garden and they don't get adequate water, uh, sometimes they'll kind of peter out, sort of shrivel up. Um, vision, in my opinion, um, is much more drought tolerant and a much sturdier uh, a stilby than most of the other varieties out there. So this is called vision right here. The stem is much sturdier. Um, this flower stalk is, is nice and thick and sturdy on some of the a stilby. It is uh, very fine and delicate, so it holds up better. The, the, the foliage itself is sturdier, and then the plant just seems to be more robust in general. So this can take uh, part sun to part shade. I probably wouldn't put it in dense, dense shade, but it can do north side of the house, you know, north foundation or up against a house. It can do dappled light underneath a tree, um, or if it's shaded by some other bushes, it's gonna do really well. It's just getting ready to bloom right now and is going to bloom throughout May and well into June. Um, vision uh, is this purple color. There's also a vision in red and a vision in white and vision in purple. So there's a couple other visions. Um, the other nice thing about these is that they are a butterfly magnet. Uh, the butterflies love the flowers on a stilby. Uh, when, when our table of a stilby is in bloom, we will typically see uh, like the Cecropia moth, which is a big, beautiful red and multicolored moth um, or butterfly. They're, they're really neat, but you'll see a lot of butterflies on these. So even though it's not a native plant, it's great for uh, a lot of our native insects um, and a beautiful, colorful plant to brighten up a nice shady spot. Okay, when I was talking about roses a little bit ago, I had mentioned how they sort of fell out of favor there for a while. Here's another plant that fell out of favor, um, and I really don't know why. Um, this is a bearded iris right here. Um, I think this one is Beverly Sill. Yes, it is. Uh, this is Beverly Sills, but we have um, maybe 20 different varieties of uh, bearded and German iris out there. So these are very easy to grow plants. Um, they were grown for many, many years. People used to uh, just buy them bare root as a, as a bulb and then plant those bulbs. Um, now we grow them in a container so that you can have an already growing plant. They are fragrant, they are great for cutting. They're available in just about every color under the rainbow. Uh, you have these kind of blue-green sword-like leaves. Um, nice clumping plant, big beautiful flowers. So uh, real easy to grow. This is a full sun to part shade and um, you know, nice hardy perennial, really unique flowers. Um, that one's uh, kind of a peachy pink, almost translucent in nature. So really kind of a neat one. We've got some bright purples, we've got some yellows. Um, like I said, a lot of them are fragrant. So 
really a neat plant for the garden and can add some interesting structure. So even when they're not in bloom, I like these, this sword-like foliage um, offers some nice contrast to more of your mounded or full foliaged plants. So that's Beverly Sills Bearded Iris. I brought a couple of native plants along that are just starting to come into bloom. Uh, this is part of our Natural Gardens native uh, collection. So these are local ecotype. Uh, that means that the seed for these plants has been collected in uh, generally a 100 or 150 mile radius to our location. And uh, they collect the seed, they grow these from seeds, so these are not cultivars or, uh, or grown in a lab or anything like that. Uh, this is wild geranium, geranium maculatum. Uh, beautiful, uh, it's also known as big root geranium, but really a lovely native perennial. This is great for shady to part sun locations. Um, I have some of this home underneath a large oak tree. It's kind of right out at the edge of the canopy of the tree. So it gets shaded in the morning and midday. It gets a little bit of nice afternoon sun, which it's certainly tolerant of. Um, loaded with purple flowers. This one's just getting ready to bloom here. Um, hardy, reliable, native perennial. This is uh, something that, again, that you could use on the north foundation of your house or in a shady situation underneath a tree where it's gonna get dappled light. Uh, like I said, very reliable, um, deer and rabbit resistant, really holds up well. Um, so kind of a kind of a nice little plant. The other uh, natural garden native plant that I brought along is called wild columbine, and I mean that is just a really cool little flower. I'm going to hold it up here because they dangle. You can kind of see the inside is really unique, and on the outside you've got these. Uh, kind of individual florets, just really a cool, they're almost like little upside down lanterns. Um, really a beautiful plant. This will reseed itself a little bit, so you may wanna give it some room to reseed. Otherwise you can always dig them up. It is not aggressive or invasive by any means, um, but it will reseed itself a little bit. It's just coming into bloom, so you've got some uh, blooms that are already open. You've got some buds that are still quite uh, tight and some others that are coming along here. This is a fairly tall perennial. Um, wild columbine will get around 24, maybe even 30 inches tall, sometimes even a little taller than that. Um, kind of interesting lobed leaves, hardy, disease resistant. Um, pretty, uh, pretty neat little plant. Um, occasionally you'll see the uh, uh, hummingbirds getting after these early in the year uh, when they're in bloom. Um, so really a nice native perennial, that's wild columbine. wanted to bring this plant over. This is an azalea called Karens. And when we talk about gardening or planting in Northern Illinois, azalea is not often what comes to mind. Usually when you hear azalea, you think about uh, the South, uh, you think about the Masters Golf Tournament and things like that. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty true and accurate, but uh, Illinois is a tough, uh, tough growing environment for most azaleas. Um, most azaleas like a well-drained soil. They're not tolerant of our heavy clay. They don't like our alkaline soil. So you, you, know, you just have strike one after strike two and it's just really difficult for the plants to grow. Uh, Karens though is actually quite tolerant of all of those things. I have Karens azaleas planted along the west foundation of my home uh, underneath some low garage windows uh, right up against the foundation. They are uh, open and exposed to the west uh, we do have a typical heavy Northern Illinois soil. They're doing great. I do recommend fertilizing them with an acidic uh, fertilizer like Hollytone. Um, that Hollytone would be wonderful. You can also use a soil acidifier that definitely helps uh, keep the rich dark green color um, and prevents them from getting nutrient deficient. But if you're gonna try an azalea in Illinois, uh, I would recommend Karens. There's a lot of other varieties commonly sold at uh, the hardware stores and places like that. Um, some of the bright red ones, and they're beautiful when you see them, and it's awfully tempting. Um, but I can tell you from experience, those are not good varieties for our areas. You won't find those here at Wasco, um, but you will find this really nice uh, Karens azalea. Uh, Karens is what's considered a semi-evergreen azalea. 
So if you look in the plant here, you're going to see these these leaves right here, like this brown one, those are and this green one here, these are leaves from last year. So those leaves survived the winter. Some of these brown ones are going to fall out, but now you're getting this nice fresh green foliage. So it'll keep some leaves, some will fall out and, and it'll get replaced by new foliage. Uh, they, the leaves turn burgundy in the fall, which is really nice. So you get this nice burgundy cast throughout the winter months. And then some of those leaves will green back up in the spring. Some of them will just turn brown and fall out. But like I said, they'll get replaced by that nice fresh green foliage. And of course, the beautiful purple flowers are fantastic. It's a heavy blooming variety. And again, it's one that's very well suited to Illinois. So this plant doesn't look like much right now. In fact, uh, if you look closely, you see a couple of these big uh, dead stems in there and you might wonder why in the world we're even selling it. But um, this is actually one of my uh, favorite uh, large perennials. So this particular, this is a hibiscus. It's a perennial hibiscus. Uh, this one is uh, part of Proven Winners Summerific Collection. Uh, we carry, uh, I would say 12 or 15, maybe more varieties of perennial or hardy hibiscus. So this one is called Berry Awesome, Summerific Berry Awesome. It has this nice dark green, almost a tinge of burgundy to the leaf. Uh, that's the leaf color. And then the flowers are about six to seven inches across, bright pink with a little red throat in there. Uh, beautiful large flowers, heavy blooming. These love, love, love the heat. So you can see they're just starting to grow. Um, in terms of care, it is a true perennial. So these, these stems, even though they feel like a woody stem like you'd have on a shrub, they will not survive the winter. Those stems are dead. You just cut them down basically as low to the ground as you can. We typically trim those back in late April. Um, so a lot of people plant these and see those dead stems not coming back when all of their other shrubs are waking up for the year and they think that the plant is dead. In fact, I've actually had people dig them up and bring them back in thinking they were dead. I said, no, go home, put that back in the yard, let it go until we get some consistently warm weather. And uh, virtually every time the plant wakes up as it should, as soon as the soils get warm. Um, once they start to wake up, they grow uh, quite fast. Um, this particular variety will, uh, will get around three to four feet tall. Some of them are a little shorter, some are actually taller. I have some at home that get every bit of uh, about five feet high. They probably bloom for two plus months. Um, so really heavy blooming plant, uh, very large flowers, uh, really neat tropical feel to it. So if you're looking for that, you know, big summer color flower, uh, this would be a great one. Uh, any of the summerific series are nice, but the um, perennial hibiscus or hardy hibiscus in general are uh, really neat plants. They add a unique texture. Uh, their leaves, some of them are, are finer and more cut, like almost like a, sort of like a Japanese maple. Um, some of them are a little larger. Some are dark burgundy or black almost. Some are bright green. So there's kind of uh, a whole wide range of colors and textures you can choose from. The flowers will be white, pale lavender, bright pink, deep red. Some of them are multicolored where you'll have a swirl in it. So it'll be like white with a swirl of pink on each petal. So. Uh, a lot of really unique color options to choose from as well. So that's the hardy hibiscus. So this is the largest plant that I brought up here. This is um, a wonderful uh, dwarf Canadian hemlock or dwarf Eastern hemlock that is uh, grown by, uh, by Monrovia Nursery out in, uh, uh, out in Oregon and California. Um, this particular one is grown in Oregon. It, it is their own plant. It's an exclusive Monrovia introduction. It's called Emerald Fountain. Emerald Fountain Hemlock. Um, you can kind of see these arching branching stems here. I'm just going to kind of rotate it a little bit. So normally Eastern Hemlock or Canadian Hemlock is a, uh, an evergreen tree with a strong dominant central leader that goes up and nice wispy branches that kind of go out and it keeps a traditional Christmas tree shape. 
Emerald Fountain tends to have multiple leaders. So instead of having just one trunk, it tends to have multiple trunks. They come up and then they kind of fountain out, thus the name Emerald Fountain. It is a um, small to moderate sized uh, plant. So uh, Emerald Fountain eventually will get a approximately eight to 12 feet tall. So it, it's not a big plant. A uh, regular Canadian hemlock can get 30 plus, um, but the Emerald Fountain, I would say maxes out uh, on the high side at 12 feet by about six feet wide. It can take full sun to virtually full shade. I have one at home underneath, um, underneath a maple tree. So it is on the west side of the home, but it's shaded uh, on the south by a maple and on the west by a maple. So I don't know that it actually gets any direct sunlight at all. It may get some filtered light throughout the day, but that's about it. Uh, it's doing wonderfully. It uh, unfortunately did sustain just a little bit of um, snow damage when we had a, a heavy wet snow a couple winters ago. I did a couple of the branches broke on it. I had to snip those out and it's filling back out and doing fine. Um, but lovely plant. The mature needles are dark green on the top. And I don't know how well this will show up on camera, but the bottom is a white or kind of bluish color. So the bottom is white, the top is green, and then the new growth is very limey green. So it gives it this multicolored uh, appearance, especially in the spring, but really a lovely plant to soften up a harsh space um, or, a, or a dark space that's gonna do really well in there. So that's Emerald Fountain Hemlock. <laughs> All right, lastly for today, I brought a peony. If you're looking for a wonderful Mother's Day gift, um, the peony selection this year is absolutely incredible. There's uh, easily 30 plus varieties in stock. They are all budded up. Um, you can see these flower buds here. All of the varieties are well budded right now. Some of them like our tree peonies are actually blooming already. Um, there's sort of three groups of peonies. There's the old fashioned peonies, which uh, most people are fairly familiar with. They see them on old farms and things like that. Beautiful, old, long lived plants. Uh, a peony can live 100 plus years. Its root system can go down 12 to 15 feet deep. Um, that's what makes them so long lived. They're uh, tolerant of just about everything. Um, pretty easy to grow. A uh, minor disease issue would be powdery mildew. Aside from that, they're uh, very, um, very hardy, very disease resistant plants. Um, so that's old fashioned peony. And then tree peony is kind of a weird woody uh, peony. So it has a woody stem, a lot of character, kind of odd. Um, it doesn't get a lot of flowers, but the flowers are big and beautiful and, and more unique than the traditional old fashioned peonies. Um, a Japanese uh, hybridizer uh, by the name of Itu um, was able to successfully cross them. He was successful at crossing a tree peony with an old fashioned or what we call herbaceous peony. And when you cross those, you get an intersectional hybrid or what we call uh, as an Itu peony um, named after the hybridizer. So this is an Itu peony right here called Takara. Uh, Takara is Japanese for treasure. Uh, this has a beautiful pale pink flower with a dark red center and a um, little yellow in the middle. The, when you cross the two peonies, when you have an intersectional hybrid, you get the best of both worlds. You get the big, beautiful, unique flowers that are common on the tree peony. You also get the sturdiness of the tree peony. So tree peonies don't really flop over or need staking as much as the old fashioned peonies do. Uh, but old fashioned peonies are known for their high bud count. So you have one plant with many, many flowers on it. Um, and so when you cross them, you get the best of both worlds. You get the high bud count of, an, uh, of a herbaceous peony. You get the sturdiness of the tree peony. You get the big, beautiful flowers of the tree peony. You get this really unique uh, sort of cut leaf foliage. Um, and you get some very unique colors that you can't get out of a traditional peony. Um, we have yellow peonies. Those are very uncommon, uh, beautiful plants like Bartsella uh, and Yumi. Um, those are yellow uh, E2 peonies. There's uh, things like Takara, there's copper colors and just some really beautiful uh, color selection in the E2 peonies and in the regular peony selection. Um, the peonies are fragrant. They're great for cutting. 
One of the unique things about the E2 peonies is that as soon as they're done blooming, if you snip off the flower uh, and you go back right above a leaf joint, so like if this flower bud here, when this is all bloomed out, if I go ahead and snip that right back here and I do that to all of the, what would be uh, traditionally called a seed pod, if I trim off all of those seed pods right after the flower is done blooming, um, a well-established E2 peony will actually throw out some secondary buds later in the summer. So regular peonies and tree peonies can't do that, but the uh, E2 peonies can. So they'll uh, throw out some extra flowers later in the year. So almost like a little uh, bonus bloom season late in the summer. So um, beautiful plants, very hardy, very easy to grow um, with a lot of color selection. So uh, the peony selection is great. They would be a beautiful Mother's Day gift. We have a beautiful selection of hydrangeas and roses. Uh, the hanging basket selection right now is uh, second to none. It is top notch. We have big 16 inch uh, mammoth baskets. We have 10 inch baskets that'll fit on even a small shepherd's hook and everywhere in between. We have baskets for sun, we have baskets for shade. Uh, we've got mono baskets, meaning just one flower in there. If you like it a little more simple, if you like all the different colors, we have the combo baskets, which have two, three, or four different varieties in them. So you get some contrasting colors and textures and um, really looks great in there. The next few nights are gonna be uh, fairly cold. I don't think we're gonna see any frost anymore, um, but if, if we do have a cold night, hanging baskets, of course, are easy just to take in for the night. So um, buy your baskets now while the selection is great. On a nice day like today, put them outside. If we're having a cold night, throw them inside in the garage or in the front porch, uh, you know, something like that. And uh, they should hold up great that way. Um, we're open all day. We have gift certificates available, gift cards. If, uh, if you're not sure what your uh, mom may like for, for Mother's Day, but you want to get her a gift, our gift cards are really, really popular. Then she can come and pick out whatever she'd like. So uh, as always, we're here to help. We're here to answer questions. Um, we have a wonderful uh, educated staff that uh, can help you choose uh, the right plant for the right spot. So whenever you're ready, come on in. We'd love to see you. We're